Welcome to the DNA Talks podcast, where we take on the mission of unlocking the code of your genetics. This season is all about you, upgrading your health, not just on the surface, but down to the root cause. Join us as your clinicians at the DNA company investigate your DNA and beyond. The intention of this podcast is to enhance your lifestyle by changing what is in your control. This does not substitute the medical advice given by your personal doctor, therapist, and other healthcare professionals. Bonjour, mes amis. Uh, my name is Dr. Krista Kostroman, as a few of you have met me before, and I'm the Chief Science Officer here at the DNA Company. And I have the most delightful pleasure today to, to be conversing with, engaging with, and to an extent interviewing uh, one of the founding members of the DNA Company who we have based so very much of our work effort and clinical effort on his understanding, interpretation, and and dancing with genetics. And so um, I'm delighted today to introduce our podcast guest, Dr. Mansoor Mohammed. Hello, sir. It is good to see you. It is good to have you here. It's a pleasure, Krista. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and what I would love to do, I think, you know, a lot of our audience is familiar insofar as you've you've spoken a lot about your engagement with DNA Company and, and your interpretations of genes, but I would love if you just take a moment to kind of introduce yourself again, you know, speak to your involvement with the DNA Company, your your involvement in its conception, right? As as well as kind of how you've found your way into genetics, how where your passion sits, what what drew you to this initially. So I'm. A, uh, thank you so much for that opportunity, Krista. And first and foremost, it's just such a pleasure to see where you and your team, certainly led by Tracy, has taken the company. It's it's uh, seeing and and sort of on the sidelines for the last couple of years. Um, obviously, the DNA company is a bit of a baby of mine. Obviously, of others as well. They were it's certainly not just my mind, but the brilliance of several individuals. But I just wanted to tell you, I'm just so incredibly proud of what you guys have done. And this for me is kind of like, a, you know, sort of um, just coming back to a party and watching it, how the kids have grown up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, yeah. we, you and I used to have so many conversations about when we would review patient profiles and new DNA discoveries. So I guess it's a good place to start from there. I am a clinical geneticist. I love all things genetics. I've, for the longest time, I've just been enraptured by the concept that as human beings, there's this thing within us, this operating manual within us, our genome, and that, you know, you you can look at someone and you say, yeah, I got that nose from mom, or, you know, this particularly personality quirk that I have is from dad, or even grandma or grandpa. And so you've got all of these outward superficial things, you've got behavioral things, and then of course, you've got the inner workings of your body, all or a large to a large degree, coming from this operating manual that we've inherited from our parents, this genome. And so I guess that's all to say that the wonderment of that, the wonderment that what makes the subtle beauties and sometimes not so beauties of the human condition <laughs> can often be traced to our genomic makeup, for me, that's just, it's, it's, when I say miraculous, I, use, I mean the word in its full context. That's a miracle as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And being a geneticist and being sort of sometimes through my career at the right place at the right time to benefit from this knowledge of genomics and to pursue this passion, to pursue this wonderment of mine, it, it's just been the best of all worlds. You know, you say, you tell someone, mm-hmm. do something you love. And do something that you love that hopefully could make an impact in human beings and you'd be happy. Well, if that's the recipe, then I'm incredibly happy because I do get to do what I love. I do get to try and help as many people as I can. And really, that's a fulfilling day for me. Where did this journey begin? I have a double major PhD in immunology and transgenics. So from my earliest career moments I was interested in looking at how genes, i.e. human genes, in this specific context, I was studying the human genes of the immune system, specifically of immunoglobulins, the things that make up our uh, our humoral defense system. In other words, how do we react to challenges, infectious challenges, and so forth. 
And I was studying these immunoglobulin, human immunoglobulin genes, and I wanted to try, those were the heady days of the early 90s, where mm. the concept of transgenics had just started. So this is where we were using animal models. So you'll all remember Dolly the sheep, for example. So we were <laughs> cloning animals on the one hand. And why were we doing that? Because we were trying to use animal models to both study the human condition and to even potentially make sort of, we could almost say, for want of a better word, spare parts or human proteins that could be used for clinical mm -hmm. purposes. And in mm -hmm. those days, and still to this day, one of the most important proteins that we have tried and we continue to try to make are human antibodies. Because, of course, it is the study of human antibodies, not just from an infectious perspective and how the body deals with infections, but because of how antibodies work, one of the most amazing places we've used this concept of making human antibodies is in pharmaceutics to direct chemotherapies or to direct the medicine mm -hmm or the drug mm -hmm. intended specifically to the cell and to the part of the cell or to the part of the body that we wanted to go to. This is the combining of pharmaceutics, mm -hmm. immunology, and genetics, so in this case, transgenetics. So in other words, mm -hmm. to summarize, what I spent my early career doing was designing how we would use the genes for human antibodies mm -hmm. so as to deliver, specifically deliver uh, medical therapies, including chemotherapies, to the parts of the body or the cells of the body that we wanted so as to maximize the benefit of the drug and minimize its impact or negative impact in the body. Well, that's where I started my career. And it was some very heady times and heady years because I was one of the first people to learn the techniques of taking human genes out of the human genome Right? So actually taking the human gene out of the human genome and putting it into a different genome, in this case, animal genome, and then studying how a human gene was being expressed and produced, i.e. its protein produced in an animal model. And because of those years, two things happened. I became one of the first people to, because the human antibody gene is really, really small. It's actually very small compared to other genes. So when you look at the impact of the antibody genes, how important it is versus its size, I guess we can say size does not matter in this case. And so I, because I was taking these ultra small genes and putting them in animal models, I had to find a way of following. Did my gene go where I wanted it to go? Is it behaving the way that I wanted it to behave? And so I developed a series of compendium technologies, which led me at the right, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I was doing my postdoc at UCLA, developing the technologies that I just described. And researchers at Baylor College of Medicine, who arguably were at the forefront of the Human Genome Project at the time, you know, when you look at the different academic institutes that were contributing to the Human Genome Project, obviously there were notable institutes across the world. But one of the best institutes in the U.S. that was contributing to the Human Genome Project was Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, in Houston. Uh, I was at UCLA in South California, and trust me, I was not about to leave South California for anywhere else, except for the incredible opportunity that Baylor posed to me. And what was that opportunity? They got a wind of the work that I was doing with these unique human antibody genes and that I was one of the few people that could trace where was the gene going, how was it behaving, because it was so small. And on their side of things, they had developed the technology to start making something called microarrays. And microarrays is where we were starting to embed on glass slides multiple thousands of pieces of DNA so that we can scan the whole human genome simultaneously. And it was a technology known as comparative genomic hybridization, of which I was an inventor and founder of that technology. And it became the first technology. Of course, there were other you know, noteworthy leaders in that field, Dr. Dan Pinkle, Dr. Joel Gray, but I was probably considered one of the top five inventors in the field of whole genomic comparative genomic organization. And so 
here becomes the first transition in my career. I go from only studying antibody genes to then studying the whole human genome and contributing to the platform, literally several uh, patents in the field of CGH. I'm the primary author of it, by God's grace. And then that new chapter of my life, so now we're talking about the early 2000s, and all of a sudden I was thrust in the limelight of having invented and having contributed to this whole human genome technology. So now we're in the real, you've got to imagine now the uh, President Clinton in 2001 had just made the announcement, in 2000, my apologies, had just made the announcement of the completion of the human genome. And that's when I was, uh, you know, developing these technologies. Um, and so, of course, I really got caught up in the applications of these whole human genome microarray technologies, uh, and I was given an incredible opportunity. So you've got to imagine, I'm still a postdoc. Most postdocs have several years ahead of them before they leave the hallowed halls of academia. And because of my Baylor College wanted to start a company. And so Baylor College funded a company called Spectral Genomics. Uh, it was a spin-off, actual separate company, and I was given the incredible opportunity to be one of its founders and its scientific director to take the to take the 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 inventions that we were making and make a company out of it. And spectral genomics became uh, literally the first whole genome testing company. We really those were really heady years, Krista. I was traveling the world, speaking, giving the plenary talks at most of the genetic. Uh, organization meetings in the world, American Society of Human Genetics, the Society of Human Genetics, the European Society of Human Genetics. And so for those years, I kept giving the plenary discussions on these on the subject matter. And where we felt that we were going to use this technology the most was, unsurprisingly, in those days, because you got to imagine, we've just sort of, we've gotten the human genome information we're able to scan the whole human genome for the first time. From a career perspective, you know, rare is it that you get to participate in the evolution of something at the very first parts of it. And so, you know, I was there in those very first years contributing to it. So it really was, it was heady. It was some heady years. But where we felt that we would use this was, unsurprisingly, in trying to improve cancer diagnostics. Um, and so very quickly, what we, and I'll speed up here, much of those, and there's a reason I'm telling the story with this detail is in those early days of human genomics, you've got to remember something here, Krista. The human genome is the operating manual of the human body, right? It's, it's literally the instructions telling every one of your cells how to do the minutia of jobs that it has to do for you and me and every other human being to be as healthy as possible. And not only is it the operating manual of the cells of our body, it's the same operating manual, whether that's a retinal cell, whether that's a cell on the tip of the finger that we don't really give two hoots about, whether it's a cardiac cell, a liver cell. It's the same operating manual, the same operating manual telling all of these variegated cells in the body that behave so totally differently, some that we don't even give any thought to, others we'd be very, you know, very, very careful about, our neural cells, our cardiac cells. And yet it's the same operating manual, okay, so that's known. And you've got to think about it, we've just landed on the transcript of that operating manual, the sequencing of the human genome. And here we are, we developed a technology to scan the whole manual. And what did we apply it for in those early days? We applied it, you know, rightfully so, to a degree, in trying to diagnose cancers, trying to diagnose a childhood developmental abnormalities. Uh, Prader Willi syndrome, Angelman syndrome, all of these developmental challenges up to and including autism spectrum disorder, of which myself and my colleague Steve Scherer wrote the first whole genome uh, paper on the subject matter. And so we were publishing some of the best uh, publications in the time. We were involved in those publications, but here is the point and the moral of the story. Everything that we were doing up until then equipped with the operating manual of the human body 
And all we were doing, all, a big all, but we were using it for diagnostic of diseases. Right? So think about it. You've got the operating manual of the human body, and all you're interested in is when is something broken and what will be the disease that it, co- it, it, it causes. So I give the analogy that this is like having the operating manual of a really complex machinery, the entire operating manual of how to do, and all you're interested in reading is the troubleshooting sections of the manual. And I would offer the, that paradigm, I feel, and, and that, this is shifting now, but I would offer that paradigm is pervasive within any medical field, right? It is. We, it is. we receive people, we say, what is broken? Okay, let's fix it. Let's, you know, yeah. often let's put a Band-Aid on it, right? Yeah. But we're not so far thinking as to what do we do with your health so that you're joyful in life and that you're enjoying your time within your body and what your body is able to do. Absolutely. And, and, and this preoccupation, as you've just so beautifully put it, that sets the almost theme and precedent of the way we practice medicine, which is that it is illness care and not well-being. And I think, you know, we, we probably get off the rails here if we go on to why that is the case and the over-pharmaceuticalization of medicine. Of course, pharmaceutics is a gift to, 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 to mankind. Absolutely. To, Absolutely. It has a purpose and a place. It has a purpose. But we have been somehow over, uh, we've been beaten over the head that the human body should only be studied through the lenses of either when it is broken or Mm -hmm. through the lenses of the pharmaceutic uh, upregulation of the body, as though the human body in its natural state isn't beautiful, isn't awesome, isn't and so I end this full arc of that beautiful question you've asked me as to, you know, kind of where, where did I find my passion? And it was the passion of just loving the human form and function, human form, function, behavior, being always from a little child, being awed by, I come from these, from the Caribbean islands where we've got huge families and, you know, a string of aunties and uncles. And we, we tend to grow up in a very communal environment and so I was always struck by human behavior, uh, human physiology. Uh, the Caribbean is a very mixed, a, I'm a mutt, for example. I've got so many different genetic, you know, uh, ethnicities mixed in me. And so I was always struck by that, the love of that. And then my story arc goes to being just this young, you know, fool at the right place at the right time, doing an amazing PhD then getting this amazing postdoctoral set of positions, first at UCLA, then Baylor College of Medicine, then just really being at the right place at the right time and contributing to literally on the ground at the time, the discovery and development of genomic technologies. And I end this first part of my story by saying, and with all of that, I wouldn't change anything. But where did I land? I landed in the industry That was the illness industry. I landed in the industry of using genetics and genomics purely for disease diagnostics. And that's the first phase and the end of the first phase of my career. And that took me to about 2011. And then in 2011, I had a real epiphany. It was literally one of those storied moments. I was in a cafe with a very, very close colleague of mine, another uh, geneticist. And was aware of the multiferous places my work was being shown and and, and published. And and he said, you know, Mansoor, he was thanking me and congratulating me. At the time, there were some real wins. We'd we'd, we'd just finished publishing the first use of whole genomics for breast cancer diagnostics. We just finished publishing the first use of whole genomics for leukemia diagnostics, for prostate cancer diagnostics. We just published a whole number of things using the technologies, myself as the senior author or contributing author. And so he was congratulating me on that. But he said, and he asked me, he said, you know, Mansoor, did you think that your career would land you where you're only using the genome for disease diagnostics. It was like he was reading this part of my consciousness that I, again, as the story is going, that it was weighing on me that here we've had this whole incredible operating manual and we're only using the troubleshooting sections of when something's broken. And so to now complete the story, 
in 2011, Krista, when you truly have, you thought everything's happy, you you, you know, you don't think you have to change <laughs> And then no, someone comes along and, and says something to you that just really rocks your boat. Yeah. And yeah. 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 I, I can remember yeah. everything about that meeting. <laughs> And yeah. I could remember leaving that meeting going, geez, yeah. That, yeah. Do I just do I just finish my career only <laughs> looking at the human yeah. genome yeah. for when something is yeah. diseased? Uh, yeah. And so I and, call, Yeah, I was gonna say I offer I offer reverence to that because I, I, I feel like there's an element of I think many people experience those moments in their life. And there's an element both of humility to hear it and then bravery to act upon it. So I think, you know, as 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 we navigate and support kind of the work that came after this moment, I offer gratitude towards it because I think it's it's supporting a shift in the way medicine is being offered to the world. And that's so important because that shift from disease medicine to wellness medicine is an important one. And 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 so that takes us beautifully to uh, what I would call the second uh, evolution of my career. And I'm now on the, the third second epoch. <laughs> the second epoch. Uh, I'm now on the third epoch, which we'll get there, I presume, at some point during this conversation. Oh, yes, but, very well. so, so the second epoch is, I honestly, Krista, I left that meeting thinking, gosh darn it, um, no, I can't just focus. I've been given a blessing. I was, you know, I'd had all of the right publications, all of the right uh, intellectual stimulations and colleagues. We were partnering with Harvard. We were partnering with Cambridge. We were partnering with some of the best institutes in the world. I was, at, at that point in time, I had already been the, so not, so just to go back, I had been the director and founder of Spectral Genomics. I then was hired mm. as the director, the youngest director of genomics of Quest Diagnostics, the largest reference lab in North America. It was an $8 billion mm -hmm. company. Now I think it's something around $15 billion. I was the first director of genomics for them. I had become mm -hmm. the CEO at the end of this epoch. I was the CEO of the first NASDAQ traded diagnostic company in cancer diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Right at that point was when this conversation happened. And I resolved myself to do something different. I resolved to use what I'd gained at that point and go back to the human genome purely and utterly from the perspective of could I use the human genome to start understanding the human body functionally? A very just just mm -hmm. just a simple if it is in fact the operating manual mm -hmm. and if the body is the recipient of that operating manual, the human body, and if there's mm -hmm. so much we clearly don't understand about the human body, and the beauties mm -hmm. of it and, the, and the, the strengths and vulnerabilities of it and vulnerabilities are not weaknesses in and of them. They're just vulnerabilities. Yeah. Then I wanted to be someone who dedicated themselves to, as a genomicist, to do this. And so in 2011, believe it or not, right at the end of that year, I resigned from my position, retired. Mm -hmm. But I started my own consulting firm. It was meant to be a self-consulting. It was meant to just give me, I was blessed to be financially quite stable at that point, to be able to take some time and just study the human genome. Just study the human genome. Oh, yeah. um, and How study, delicious that must have been. I know. And you know, Crystal, what's really cool was to study it without anyone pulling any strings. In other words, I had no... Uh. Um, I had no one telling me, well, it's for the discovery of this drug, or you only can study this disease. I was yeah. able to just, I want to just study the human genome. And mm. I had the time. And that gave rise, if we speed up, uh, Krista, that gave rise to what? It gave rise to me being one of the founders of a field of genomics, again, just being in the right place at the right time, of something we call functional genomics. And Dr. Jeff Bland and others are, you know, I, I can't even step under their feet. They are gurus and I'm just a kindergartner. But I really admired the work they were doing in biochemistry. But no one was doing it in genomics, right? And so I wanted to ask this question. And here's then the conclusion of epoch number two, the start of the DNA company, all in one. Believe it or not, I wanted to be able to ask a fundamental question. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to hide it. And there's, you know, it's not that I am hung up on it. It's just because I consider it a miracle. I've always been, as I mentioned, 
absolutely enamored by the human body. And I don't mean that hopefully in a creepy way. I mean just just enamored by the beautiful diversity of the human body. Plain and simple. The, the female form, why are some women shaped a certain way? Why, why their body types, the male form? Just enamored by the human body. And so I wanted to put a task to myself when I started the second epoch. I said, okay, if the human genome is in fact the operating manual, and there's a lot of debate as to what, how much does it contribute to, how much does diet contribute, how much does lifestyle and environment contribute, clearly they contribute a lot. Hey, at the end of the day, this human genome is clearly contributing to forms and prototypes of human uh, uh, shapes that we can see. And those prototypes, they occur geographically. We have different people in different parts of the world that have, you know, very classically similar prototypes of body form and classically dissimilar to other parts of the world. It's okay. So clearly, this couldn't just be diet. Right? It's not geography. So again, there was this thing proving or pointing that the human genome had with it the ability to explain human form. Now, I really want to pause here for a moment because you've got to understand, this is 2012 now, okay? And until that point in time, and actually, truthfully speaking, until DNA Company, and actually, truthfully speaking, even until now, the wider appreciation that a person's genetic makeup can actually be used to predict body type, body shape, the nuances of the body. Is this young woman, to sh not that it matters one iota, but just to show you the nuance of it, does her genetic makeup, can it explain a proclivity to something as simple as cellulite, to something as simple as stretch law? Can, in fact, the human genome explain such nuances of the human body? So this was the question. No one had answered it at that point in time. And what I did was I set myself to doing this. I said, okay, if in fact the human genome is the operating manual, then it should be able to a large degree to explain the nuances of human form and function. And I realized how almost pedestrian this sounds, but you've got to understand, to this date, it's not been published. And certainly back then, it was never published. There is no geneticist, save a couple, one of whom you're speaking to, I suppose, and any other that I've known. There's, it's beautifully as yourself. Krista, to this day, you cannot, and I've spoken to the top, top geneticists around the world, from the top colleges and, and, and universities around the world, and they're so pin-focused on the particular disease or the particular subject matter that they've lost sight of the holism of the human body. And so I'm going to make a very audacious statement. Still to this day, there is no geneticist who can look at the human genome content and actually tell someone remarkable things that they shouldn't know about their bodies, i.e., without me seeing someone, if I know that she's a female, I can tell her what's the shape of her body, what are the challenges of her body, what are the strengths of her body, how does her body respond when she exercises, male or female for that matter. Uh, what is likely to be her menstrual cycle if she chooses, if she's menstruating, if she's not on birth control, how does her body respond if she were to go on birth control? In other words, and then this is the second epoch. This is what I gave to DNA Co. When I realized that, yes, in fact, the human genome does contain the code, the instruction for not just the minutiae of if something is broken, what is the disease, and not just the superficiality of certain, you know, do you have blue eyes, do you have curly hair, but the beauty of the human form, function, variation, strengths, vulnerabilities, externally, internally, once I discovered what I discovered and I was able to prove it over and over and over again, by all means, or I should say by no means, have we tapped out the human genome. We know, we don't know far more than we know. 
to be, to be clear. But the mere fact that we have, in fact, been able to take this transcript, read it to a certain degree, become, as I used the term, and I had used this and I coined it for DNA company, become fluent in the language of DNA so that you're not just reading, you know, disease parts of the language, but you're reading it as a totality and be able to make the insights as supple as human body form and function, then I knew we were onto something. That is what gave rise to the DNA code. Um, and along the way, we've just been, we were fortunate to meet clinicians like yourself and fortunate to have clinicians like you participate in this journey. And so then I will end this second epoch by saying, I think that's the greatest strength that DNA Co. was based on that no company to this date, and I've obviously been one of the very, very few in the world, if I might put aside humility for a moment, and as I continued after I left DNA Co. for the last almost three years since I've been gone, I've continued to travel the world, I've expanded my clinical, I've only been practicing clinically, and through that, I've met more and more and more geneticists across the world, and I pinch myself each time when I realized that despite the further continuation of the genomic field, obviously, globally, what has been captured and what was left at DNA Co. still has a nuance of understanding about the human body through the lenses of genetics that very, very few scientists, geneticists, clinicians have. And that's what we left yeah. three years ago. Yeah. So what yeah. excites me yeah. is how much more we can do. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think as someone that is so fortunate to have been trained by yourself and, and Dr. Winnie Sue as well, I cannot count the number of times I've gone into consults and someone said, do you have a crystal ball? Like what's this witch magic that you're able to understand me without having met me yet? And I think there's always, there's something so magical that you can say within the clinical space if you're able to meet someone not only where they're at, but to offer them a space where they feel known, because that then is is where the the intangible magic of science and medicine and art and practice all meet. Yes. And I think that that lends beautifully to to my next question of this third epoch. So so I already know the spoiler alert, but but educate the audience because I think and also what I'd really like I'd offer the audience to listen for a little bit. So. So Mansoor here has articulated this incredible, and you use the words heady, right? Your your brain usually perceives um, perceives your reputation, and people know what they're getting into. And I would offer, um, I love that this moment we're able to share the heart and the passion and the curiosity and the adventure that goes into what your brain does. And I love, in particular, in this third epoch, that there's so much um, heart that is leading the way because I, I love I'm, I'm very reverent of the work that you're currently doing right now well the first thing I would say and, and again Krista you're, you're, you're far too um, complimenting I um, I do I do I do appreciate and I must say at some point several colleagues of mine finally said to me and sir you need to own this you need to at least own the fact even though I you know as your audience will know many of them would recognize that I'm a founder and a scientific founder. And for the first time, they're hearing my story. And they also recognize that they don't hear from me very much. I mean, they probably have mm -hmm. seen material that we speak because I am, what most people don't know about me is I am pathologically introverted. I, I, <laughs> I am extremely introverted. And mm -hmm. nothing pleases me more than to just be locked in a room where I get to review gobs and gobs of <laughs> studies, understand it, digest it, see it through the angles that maybe others don't see it through. So I guess what I'm saying here is thank you for, for your words and for your sentiments and for what I see as a clear reverence for the science and for the relationship that we've had. Um, I do take ownership of the fact that, yeah, I've, I've had to, with the goading and the, the, the encouragement of some of my colleagues internationally, I've had to finally say, you know what, if I don't do it, it just does not seem that others are going to take up this banner and continue yeah. this path. And I do want to say something yeah. here. I hope it's not too controversial. And that is, 
If genomic medicine, if genomics, because again, we have to understand something very, very quickly. Genetics, of course, has existed within the space of medicine for many, for decades now, you know, but up until 10 years or so ago, 10, 15 years ago, if a person said they had their genetics done, quote unquote, it usually be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong, right? You know, was it because they were got a cancer? Was it because it's an amniocentesis? So again, genetics started as core medical concepts, disease medical concepts, yeah? And then with the active companies like 23andMe, it became a very, you know, uh, Christmas stocking stuffer type uh, consumer. To find variety. out what type of earwax you have. <laughs> what type of earwax do you have? Exactly. I mean, geez, there's yeah. something called Q-tips maybe, you know, that you can use. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know, and so in, in other words, a very, a very recreational, no harm. I, I think, I think it's done a tremendous service to, to, uh, making DNA more conversational in the human, in the human audience. Okay. But we go from this core clinical use of genetics to this very recreational use of genetics and everything in between. And so I do want to say that in order for whole genomics, in order for this appreciation of the whole human genome, not just when it is broken, but through the lenses of some of the things we have alluded to in the last 30 minutes or so, the, the, the how and the function and the why and the capabilities and the vulnerabilities at a functional level of the human body, functional genomics. If we are to allow this to take its position as one of the next pillars of medicine, of one of the next pillars of human health and well-being, as it should, mm -hmm. as it absolutely mm -hmm. should. And what a travesty mm -hmm. it would be. Think about it, Krista. What a travesty it would be if in the 10 years to come, we're still not using the jewels of the human genome to help a patient understand their bodies better, help their clinician to understand their patients better, yeah. help empower individuals as to their strengths, help take away the anxieties as to their vulnerabilities, right? If we're not doing this yeah. 10 years from now, we failed, okay? Now, yeah. no, I hear that. I hear that. the statement that I want to make is in order for this to happen, in order for genetics to take its place in the bastions of true unadulterated, meaningful science, which is what it is, we've got to be careful of over-trivializing it. We've got to be mm -hmm. careful of, of diluting it to such an extent. Yes, we have to speak to the consumer population. And yes, for our patients out there, we always want to be able to express to you things in a way that you can appreciate so that you feel an ownership yeah. over it. But this is, at the end of the day, the very core of human biology. And just as you are not expected to become a neuroscientist or to understand the inner workings of cardiology, we cannot yeah. expect that we can allow any Tom, Dick, and Harry to be speaking about genetics and using yeah. it as this sort of you know, fly-by-night tool yeah. when it is at the core of medicine and if we are to allow the medical community and the consumer community to appreciate just how important this science, the science of human genomics is, we must take up the banner of keeping that science pure, keeping it at the level yeah. of true science and not at the level of gimmick. Because, you know, yeah. I'm going to say it. And I'm going to probably be shouted at it, or you might be shouted at it after the podcast. I'm going to say it. I'm okay we're with that. In world, we're in the TikTok world, right? Everything has to be 30-second, gimmicky sound yeah. bites. But if you're interested, yeah. if, if, if you're interested in something that's cool and fun for two days, that's okay. But if you're interested yeah. in really cracking the code of human biology, it's not a 30-second soundbite. It's not yeah. something that is trivialized. It, it has to be deep. It has to be meaningful. And it has to be driven by scientists who have the credentials to do so. And, and I would also offer, I'd offer two thoughts there. I think first, 
and this is lacking in the public at large, not just with genomic medicine, nuanced conversation about science, right? I think I think a lot of the consuming public would like a very binary answer of this yes or this no. And and science doesn't operate that way, especially when you're on the bleeding edge in this space like you are, because rarely will we come into a space where we know that binary yes or no, right? So there's always nuance. And it's hard to communicate that because when a, a person, a patient comes in and they're like, I'm not well, I need support. The comfort that they would seek really is here's that binary, here's exactly, right? And so it's very difficult when someone's before you seeking support to say, we don't fully know, but here's what I best know. And, and that bleeds into my second point of, and I would really encourage people as they listen to this, as they work with practitioners, the humility that must be undertaken on both sides when you're engaging with such new medicine. Because again, I think there has to be a humility to come back and say, this is what we best know now, but in a year or two from now, that might be different. And, and if I might offer an example, you and I, you and I spoke about this example before. When I first started training with yourself and Dr. Winnie, you know, we we would examine, for example, a SNP that's associated with BDNF gene. And we would say, we're looking at this in isolation and here's what it is. And, you know, for, for, for the briefness of this conversation, we'd say one is optimal and then, you know, heterozygous and suboptimal homozygous are a different way. Here are two presentations. And I would work with clients in my practice and I would say, this is your presentation. So this is probably how your BDNF is. And here are things we can do to support it. But Here's here's how your genome is, and and people, a, a small grouping of people would come back and say, that's not my experience. I have something different, right? And and I'd have to sit there with, this is what their genomic presentation is compared to this is what their experience is, and we would always work with experience, right? We don't know what else is going on and influencing that. But a year or so later, you came back and offered additional training of like, hey, guess what we learned. And it was, you know, it was, it was joyful in our sense because we love adding to our growth and adding to, you know, the clarifying of the mystery, the beautiful mystery before us. But that enabled me to go back and work differently with people, right? And, and also had me sitting there of like, oh, now I have this list of people that I have to go back and talk to. We've learned more. So it always, I think there has to be a humility on both sides as well as an, um, a motivation on the patient side to recognize, especially in the space of medicine, coming back every few years to ask the question, what have you learned, is a very valuable question. You know, look, first and foremost, couldn't agree more with the way you've just summarized things. For the audience, Krista is speaking of the concept of epistasis, which is yeah. that <laughs> when we see a gene and we see a version of a gene, and we can certainly make interpretations of the version of that gene, but ever so often, the version of a gene, i.e. the genotype, at a particular SNP, so in other words, what combination of, of alleles you have at a particular SNP, which informs the way that, that gene behaves in your body, and that we would mm -hmm. interpret a certain way, ever so often, that interpretation is actually changed depending on a completely seemingly unrelated gene and its genotype. And so Christopher, mm -hmm. the audience who will listen to this, what she's referring to is that there's some of these really hard-hitting, really well-interpretable genes like BDNF, like Compt, and others that we can mention, for which you can often interpret the impact of a genotype in that gene, and the patient will say, oh my goodness, how did you know that about me? But ever so often... Mm -hmm. As Krista mm -hmm. pointed out, a patient goes, well, no, you know, now that you mention it, that doesn't quite match up until we realize that it does match up if you understood the other compendium points of genetics. Yeah. And so the first point that I want to make is as we learn more about genetics and genome, we continue to be marveled that it really is a beautiful, encompassing operating manual. Number one. But number two, there will always be the, the, the occasion or the possibility that, of course, we know the human genome isn't the end and be all of your existence, of course. And so that uncertainty should never stop us from including this in the understanding. It's, it's, it's like saying, I understand something 80% or 90%, but because I don't understand the extra 10%, I'm not going to start using it. No, that's no, no science 
is like this. And I would conclude by saying there is literally no advancement in medicine, none that you can mention or anyone else, where we waited for every absolute certainty, uncertainty, eventuality, uneventuality before we practiced that aspect of medicine. Medicine has always been defined by what? First, do no harm, of course. Then, try your best to help the person. Then, understand that what I am doing and what I'm going to try to do in the context of all of the insights possible will be liable to observation, am I doing, we're checking in with the patient. Are we getting the, are we getting the impact that we want? This is proper medicine. And so to join between two closing points here, exactly what you've just said, and if genetics is to take its place in this continuum of medicine, understanding that we'll always Nothing can be as complicated as genetics and have someone say, oh, I'm the one that understands it all. There has to be humility. But we should move forward. However, we have to move forward ensuring that we are giving it its due right, giving it the responsibility of studying it to the fullest of our ability before we allow ourselves to speak about it. And hence now, the third epoch, as per your question. Um, so when I, when I moved on, when, when I uh, sort of took a step back and retired from the DNA company, so this is now almost three years now, mm-hmm. I, again, you know, I, I'd felt that, okay, this was this incredible company blessed with scientists and clinicians uh, and leadership yourself and, and the incredible new leadership, I want to take a moment to thank, thank Tracy, uh, Tracy Woods, the CEO of DNA Co. Um, I could not be prouder of how she's taken the company and how she has sort of amazing things were happening before, but you can tell that she came with a certain passion, a passion to bring this to where I'd hoped it would be one day, which is to serve humanity. And I realize that sounds pretty pie in the sky, but for anyone who's met Tracy and I've been honored, despite having left the company, to meet her, and I could not be more proud or happier of someone to leave this legacy that I left behind. So what did I leave it behind to do? I wanted to do two, two things. I, having you know, contributed to genomics the way that I did, I'm recognizing that in the field of genomics, what are you doing? You're studying the sequence. You're studying the transcript of the operating manual, okay? Mm-hmm. But of course, that transcript still has to be read. It still has to be manifested. And in, in the verbiage of science, what we say is you've got genomics, the sequence, the transcript, the, the, the writing of the human genome, and then you've got transcriptomics, transcriptomics, the expression of the human genome. Mm-hmm. How does it actually manifest? And then, of course, you've got the proteomics from the transcriptomics, and then you've got the metabolomics from the proteomics, and then you've got the whole omics, the whole body as it goes together. <laughs> and, and so I felt that, you know what, I, I'd done a lot in the genomic space, fair enough, and there will mm-hmm. always be more to be done, always. But I wanted to go another level. I wanted to ask, okay, can we, now that we've appreciated that the human genome does in fact contain the code for subtleties of the human body that no one previously, no one, and I say this without exception, no one prior to myself in the work that we did ever assumed that the human genome can predict, like I said, cellulite, right? And Mm -hmm. and I'm not infatuated by this point. I use it, why? Because it's so trivial, it's so superficial, yet the human Mm -hmm. genome can predict it. So once I once I understood that, I then wanted to ask, okay, can I start to understand the major drivers of the expression of the human genome? What is driving the way the genome is read? Because you know, there's this famous scene in uh, Lord of in The Hobbit, uh, where where Gandalf <laughs> meets. Um, now I'm going to be a real geek, right? But anyways, we're going total nerd nerdcore. I love it. Let's let's jump in. So, 
point was, it was a sentence. For mm-hmm. example, it's a wonderful day to do so and so. But if said mm-hmm. differently, it is, it could be, it is a wonderful day to do so and so. It is a wonderful day to do so and so. In other words, you can take a sentence, and everyone is familiar with this thing. Yeah. You can take a sentence, yeah. and depending on where you put the emphasis of that sentence, the mm-hmm. meaning is different. Yeah? It's incredible. And an insult can become a compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. Indeed. Or a compliment can become an insult. And for mm-hmm. any of the uh, for any of the Hobbit enthusiasts and fans out there, I apologize in advance. I think you all know there was where Frodo was sitting at the doorstep to his home and, and you know, Gandalf comes along and he's smoking his pipe and off we go. Anyways, so this is the nature of the human genome and how is it, it is expressed. You've got the human genome, yeah. it's the sentence, but how is it expressed? How is it verbiaged and intoned, mm-hmm. and intoned is how mm-hmm. you get the same genome giving rise to the different capabilities of the cell. Okay, so this is the mm-hmm. this is the further miracle that you can take a single transcript, a single genome, and bring forth from it such amazing diversity, both intra diversity within the human body. That again, the cell that gives rise to this gray hair over here over here mm-hmm. has the same genome and the same instruction as my retinal cell. Okay, it, 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 it's 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 miraculous. So. I got lost in embryology when I had to conceptualize the fact that this then becomes this. It was just, it's mind boggling to think of how that body, I, I hear you. I won't get lost on this, but I hear you. In a different podcast, Krista, we've got to sit down because I do have some things that will shock the world of biology and genetics because there are some things that are so outwardly morphologic that has no place in genetics. And this is coming from the geneticist. So I'm just going to put a little spoiler alert there. There are things that we assume, even the layperson will assume, is absolutely a genetic phenomenon, and it actually has no genetic correlate whatsoever. But we'll we'll leave that for another day, and maybe that's a nice little... Uh, I know, I know. I, I, I've, 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 and then it's a real doozy. It's a real doozy when you hear what it is. But okay. <laughs> yeah. So what I've been up for the last three years. So what I did over the last three years was I gave myself over to say, okay, what are the most important things that impinge on the human genome, the sequence, mm-hmm. and leave different expression of that sequence? What are the mm-hmm. things that raise that sentence, put the cup in the middle of the table, put the cup yeah. in the middle of the table, Put the cup yeah. in the middle of the table. What, what is yeah. that? What is yeah. that thing that takes a sentence, an instruction, mm-hmm. which the gene is, and gives that instruction different nuances? And mm-hmm. here's what it is: it's the gut microbiome. So your gut microbiome, that amazing universe that lives within you, we're more bacteria than humans. <laughs> it plays one of the most fundamental roles in the tonation and the intonation, I should say, of your genome. Okay, so the gut microbiome. Mm. And then the second is your hormones, your hormone uh, signature, everything from your Mm. thyroid hormones to your melatonin, to your insulin, to your testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, Mm -hmm. growth hormone, uh, cortisol, your hormones are the great conductors of the human genome orchestra. Mm. The genome is made up of Mm. 22,000 instruments, i.e. 22,000 genes that need to be played in the right symphony for optimal health, i.e. optimal health is when your genes are being played at the right time, at the right volume, at the right tempo, for the right duration, that's optimal health. Then Mm -hmm. if your genome is the instruments of an orchestra, then hormones are the conductors of that Mm -hmm. orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I was the first person to make this analogy. 
And I have since been spending the last three years expounding upon it. And so what I've mm. done include now, the third epoch is where I've gone off to study hormone replacement, specifically BHRT, bioidentical mm. hormone replacement, the good of it, the, mer- the, the beauty, absolute godsend of it, and also mm. the concerning of it, the, the mm. use of pill, birth control pill in women, in, in, in girls, mm-hmm. the, the blessing of it, but also the concerns of it. So in these mm-hmm. last three years, I've been studying more of how do we impact the expression of the human genome through the modalities of things that we can choose, such as hormone replacement, mm-hmm. such as the incredible, you know, which, which is a whole, you know, there are generations of scientists that will be needed to understand the human microbiome, you know, Mm -hmm. properly. But I've jumped in from the perspective of the person who said, okay, I understand the human genome a tad little bit from a holism perspective. Now what I want to do is I want to understand how are these, these conductors of the human genome, how are they and the human genome coming together? And that's what I've spent my last three years doing. How are they dancing together? How delightful. How delightful. So so a lot of your energies and efforts are more in the, the clinical space, if you will, working with people and understanding that dance and namely how to intervene when the dance isn't coordinated. Exactly. When that when 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 the human body needs to be playing Mozart and it's now playing, I don't know, pick your worst awful band, I don't want to insult anyone. <laughs> And that's, we won't, that's, we won't. <laughs> Gordon's, all music is beautiful, generally speaking, but when, when your genomic orchestra, and here's a point that we could leave the audience in this, I'll take a minute and paint this picture for you. Your 22,000 genes are like instruments on an orchestral stage. That stage is your nucleus. And the, these genes are going to play different tunes. And anyone who's ever attended an orchestral masterpiece knows all the instruments aren't playing at the same time, at the same volume, at the same tempo. If you did that, what you would have is noise. You would not have a symphony. The beauty of that performance, when that performance is considered a masterpiece, is when. It's when each instrument knew when should it play, when should it start, when should it stop? What volume should it play at? What tempo should it play at? When should it go into the background? When should it come into the foreground? This analogy is one of the most appropriate and succinct analogies of the human genome. Optimal health, Krista, is when our genomic orchestra of our cells plays the best symphony it can play. In other words, optimal human health is when our cells and the genes within our cells are performing, being turned on and turned off, right volume, right tempo, appropriately. Suboptimal health and illness begins when our genes lose their rhythm, when they are no longer being expressed at the right time, for the right duration, for the right volume, for the right tempo. That is disease and suboptimal health. And so the goal, and now my given, what I hope to be now my fourth epoch, is if we now understand the stage, we understand the instruments on the stage, or at least more and more understanding instruments in the stage, how can we, as you say, How can we marry the instructor knowing which instructor should be on that stage? And of course, the instructor, the hormone, you do not want insulin as the instructor on that stage for longer than is necessary. You do not want melatonin as the instructor of your genomic orchestra at 10 a.m. in the morning. You want melatonin as the, as the conductor of your genomic orchestra at 11, 12 midnight, 1 a.m., with melatonin playing a genomic lullaby. And then in the morning, you want vitamin D, 125-dihydroxycalciferol, hormone, 
testosterone, hormone, cortisol, hormone. You want those instructors conducting your human genome, playing a marching band tune. So up you go, energized. This concept of understanding the role that hormones play as the conductors of the human genome, when they should be there, for how long they should be there, so that we get a perfect symphony. Yeah, that's the goal. Optimal health is attained when we've got the human genome performing the perfect symphony. And how and what is it going to need to do that? Optimal hormonal health, optimal microbiome, obviously optimal nutrition, optimal lifestyle, optimal environment. Lots of others are talking about those things, but my focus now is going to be how do we optimize, given that hormones are the key conductors of the human genome, how can I optimize those so as to allow our cells to play the best yeah. symphony possible? That's the goal. Mm. And I, I sit back in reverence of this analogy because I think it invites support and observation from those that love music and know how optimal the symphony could be because they are the people, the outsiders that are able to hear it is the section that is coming in a little bit early or asking That's the true. questions to really understand mm. what part of the orchestra is, is, is a little bit behind or is creating noise within the beauty that we should there be hearing. Go. There you go. And here's the thing, Krista, and, and this analogy when I really kind of give thought to how am I going to explain this new field that I'm working on and designing this analogy, you know, if you go to an orchestra and you want, you can tell something's off, something's playing off, which is the smart person, the person who goes on that stage and tries to listen to these 22,000 different instruments to, or the person who looks at the conductor and looks at where is that conductor focusing his energy saying, hey, listen, you know, up or down. So the beauty here is embedded within hormones. If we begin to understand the hormonal signatures of a human being, what we begin to see is it, the hormones are the conductors of the human genome. And because hormones are readily measurable, by measuring and studying the hormonal signature within the human being over the traverse of the 24 hours, we begin to see where and when is the human body trying to change the rhythm of that cellular performance, that genomic symphony. And so I fully expect, and what I'm hoping to do in this next phase of my career is as much as, if I were to put aside humility for a moment, as much as I reinvigorated the field of genomics, I hope to reinvigorate the field of hormone uh, hormone medicine, endocrine. I don't want to say endocrinology because it's been mired in a very archaic way of looking at the body, but, but, but give a new light to understanding the true role of hormones and how they impact the human genome and look to the hormones rather than looking just to the 22,000 instruments. I can now look at just a few different hormones and pick up where in the body is struggling why is that hormone level going up too high? Why is that hormone level too low? What is the body trying to do, i.e., what is that conductor on the stage trying to correct in cellular behavior? This is where I believe, in conclusion, Krista, where medicine is going to go, and I hope to be, as I have been blessed to be on the ground in the heady days of genomics, I am just, I'm just jazzed to be giving birth to this new this new world of understanding hormones this way. And, and I hope our paths will cross here in the coming months, Krista. Absolutely. Well, I believe they will. I believe they will. And, and I think for our audiences, we'll make sure that they cross again on this platform so that we can dig into some more of the juicy nuggets, be it looking at hormones or being it, you know, the fun, quirky things that genomics does not determine. Oh, I think, I think that's so, for the nerds out there, that is going to be a very delightful deep dive. <laughs> it, it is, and I, I, I'll, I'll tease it by saying it will shock you. I, I, I guarantee you, 
it will shock you. So for the audience, I will say this. I guarantee you, if I ask you a certain question about whether a certain aspect of the human body is inherited or not, that you go, yep, I got that from mom, I got that from dad. In other words, it's inheritable. And if something is inheritable, means it has to come through the DNA. But I'm going to give you examples where there are things that are the most obvious inheritable aspects of the human body, and it has nothing to do with genetics whatsoever. Oh, this could be delightful. And I, I really value that, you know, you talked about let's not be TikTok about this and you just left a glorious little TikTok bite to, yeah. invite, our, to invite our viewers next. So now that we've come full circle and we've got you on the TikTok train, <laughs> I think it's time for us to bid you adieu. But how grateful I am for this time to chat with you and how grateful I am that our paths will cross and how grateful I am that our audiences here are going to benefit from that as well. Because I think you and I jointly approach care and approach science as a beautiful magical mystery but the exploration the understanding done to the end of supporting people and supporting their health and ensuring that it's accessible as as we go along i think between you and tracy and i we have we have that we're very guardful and mindful and um, of that vision and mission and i'm i'm just so tantalized for what is going to be coming in the next years and what how we're going to be able to help and support people. It would be an absolute pleasure, Anna Krister. Uh, Godspeed, God bless. Thank you for taking this mantle and taking this little thing that we've left that I think has such huge potential. Please tell Tracy thank you for me and for the DNA Co audience, its members, its patient populations. It's, you, you know, uh, There's so much to come and so much beauty to be discovered. Thank you for being part of this journey yeah. with us over the years and hopefully for the years to come. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll, on that beautiful concluding note, we will we'll bid everyone adieu. And thank you for spending time with us. And we look forward to chatting with and, and diving into mysteries and diving into wonder with you again soon to the end of being of support to your health. All right. Au revoir.